Hello and welcome to this AIM North America webinar on vision and reality of the UDI regulation. Before we get started, I do have some housekeeping notes to go over. First, if you do have questions, please send those via the Q&A option at the bottom of the application screen. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Also, we are recording this webinar, so we will notify you when the recording is available. Next is our antitrust policy. It's the policy of AIM North America to conduct its operations in strict compliance with the antitrust laws. No AIM North America activity shall, e shall even the appearance of a violation of the letter or spirit of the antitrust laws. And then AIM North America webinars are held for the primary purpose of advancements in our industry, which necessarily involves development of work product intended solely for the public domain. AIM North America has developed this policy for the protection of its members who engage in this important collaborative effort. I'm pleased to introduce to you all our panel of experts, starting with Dennis Black, UDI Program Director of Global Regulatory Affairs at BD, Jay Crowley, Vice President of Medical Device Solutions and Services at USDM Life Sciences, and Olga Van Grauwaller, the Manager of Global Regulatory Intelligence and Advocacy for Boston Scientific. Jay, I'll let you get things started with our first question. Great, thank you. Actually, can, do I have control over the slides? Can we might go back to the previous slide for half a second. There you go. So good afternoon, good morning, I guess, for some. Good evening. Uh, Olga, good evening. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're looking forward to this conversation, uh, which is what it's going to be. I will uh, try to lead uh, lead our, our group here down uh, down the path and, and uh, try to have some interesting dialogue about some of the issues that we're seeing. The many issues that we're seeing, I suppose, in the UDI space. Um, so I have just uh, some brief introductions. I'll go first, and then I'll let Olga go, and then Dennis. So um, I, as the title states there, um, I am at uh, USDM Life Sciences. We help medical device manufacturers with UDI implementation, among other things. Uh, I left FDA about nine years ago after uh, uh, publishing the, the UDI final regulation and have been on this journey now for 20 years and uh, continue to be uh, excited and frustrated by it all at the same time. So uh, I appreciate everyone joining us. Olga? Thanks, Jay. Uh, so my name is Olga Van Groel Lawler. I'm a manager of global regulatory intelligence and advocacy at Boston Scientific. Um, I've been heavily involved in our EU MDR um, project over the last number of years and also involved in the various MedTech Europe working groups, um, specifically in this case, the Udemed and UDI working group. Um, I also participate in, you know, different trade associations and um, efforts globally and in the GS1 Healthcare Public Policy Group. I'm also uh, sometimes speak at um, conferences related to Udemed or UDI. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it's a pleasure to be here today. I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation with Dennis and Jay. Um, so yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you, Olga. Professor Black. Good morning. I'm Dennis Black. I'm UDI Program Director for BD. It's my goal to get UDI implemented globally. And Jay was mentioning he's been on this journey for 20 years. I, I guess I feel like I've been on it as long. When I think of UDI, back in 2012, 2013, we thought of the US UDI rule. It seemed pretty simple. It seemed as though if we look 10 years into the future, we would be finished and we'd have this all figured out. But here we are 10 years later, and I think there's just a tremendous amount of work to be done. As we get regulation after regulation coming our way, I think it becomes more complicated. And as we study what the healthcare providers are looking for, I think making sure this all fits together in a way that is balanced between industry regulators and healthcare providers, I, I think we have a long road ahead. Couldn't agree more, Dennis. Um, so with that, Mike, I guess we'll go to the next slide. The first question, there we go. So Dennis, you touched on this, so we'll, we'll come back to it in a moment. Um, as hopefully many of you know, um, uh, now we're, we're coming up on, or we just passed actually, just passed um, the anniversary of, of the original publication of the UDI rule, uh, which was nine years ago. 
uh, which is amazing to think about that, that we have been on this very specific U.S. journey for nine years. We continue to learn um, all sorts of things, but we also have, as, as Olga mentioned, a lot of activity, Dennis and Olga and I and a group of others spend a lot of time talking about European UDI uh, with respect to new regulations. So Dennis, what, um, what do you think of the new regulations, the new requirements? Anything uh, in particular that you'd like to, to, to highlight or discuss? Well, I think it's just the just the sheer number of regulations that we're implementing right now that leads to the complexity, right? We think of with the European Union and having some variance between what's expected in the U.S. with what NMPA is doing in China. I think they've done a tremendously, really a great job trying to harmonize, but there are some differences. If we look at um, Taiwan and what they've done, right, country after country after country, we've seen these regulations coming out. And again, there's variation in each and every rule. And I think that is what adds to the complexity. If we look at each country, I don't know if you want to get into specifics, Jay, but we look at the market requirements and regulations and we think of what needs to be done. I think that just brings a tremendous amount of complexity to organizations to make sure that you've met all of these requirements and have still done this in such a way that you can use this information within your internal supply chain and make it useful for the healthcare provider. I think it's incredibly complicated. We can certainly come back to variation in a moment, but I want to give Olga a chance to, to weigh in on this interesting topic. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Yeah, I, I honestly, I couldn't agree with um, Dennis more. There's so much going on in this space. I, I honestly don't know how, especially small and medium-sized enterprises keep up. I mean, I think at this point, you, you need a dedicated person or even a whole team. We have a team you know, dedicated to UDI. And even still, you know, you find massive benefits being affiliated, whether it's to, you know, some kind of learning community or organization like, you know, GS1 that monitor global requirements. You know, when we look at the evolving global picture, there, there are a lot of countries aligning with the IMDRF UDI guidance, you know, which provides that framework for global regulators intending to develop UDI systems. But, um, and that of course is widely welcomed by industry and all other stakeholders. But, you know, as Dennis pointed out, we are seeing a lot of differences and they can really impact how UDI is rolled out or, you know, even just at a very high level who assigns it, right? Like little differences, like in the US, it's the labeler, in the EU, it's the legal manufacturer. And this can lead to, you know, differences in implementation. And if I I'll just segue to the EU for, for a moment, I won't go into too much detail, but, um, you know, the EU has a lot of unique concepts. You know, it has that basic UDIDI, which is that kind of aggregator of the UDIDIs to a device model or family, at, you know, kind of a high level. Um, but that's not on the label or embedded in the UDI carrier. But, you know, even, Still, if certain data elements associated with that basic UDIDI change, it can also trigger a change then in all of the associated UDIDIs. So, you know, the devil really is in the detail. And another thing really unique, I think, to the EU is that they have requirements for other economic operators in the supply chain, which, you know, don't exist in other geographies. So, you know, to keep a record of the UDI, for example, um, you know, distributors, importers, and also healthcare institutions to keep a record of class three implantable devices. Um, and another interesting nuance is that um, the member states then have a right to expand on these obligations if they so wish. And we're beginning to see that happen now too. So for example, in the Czech Republic, they're requiring uh, healthcare providers to, um, to keep the UDI of, of all classes of devices apart from their class one uh, medical devices and class A IVDs. But not only that, they're requiring, um, you know, service providers or the healthcare providers are obliged now to put it in the healthcare record of the patient as well. So it's really kind of moving that dial from, you know, being a nice to have in some geographies to an actual legal requirement in others. And just the other day, I think we're really going to see more and more of this. I saw that Italy had published um, two new decrees um, on, you know, their domestic requirements in the areas of national competency when it comes to the medical device regulations. And interesting, in the still to come, 
category, they had storage of UDI devices by health institutions. So again, another member state starting to roll out these additional requirements. So I think we can expect a lot more to come here. Um, and then, you know, there's the specter of, of other, other identifiers in the EU, such as the master UDIDI. I don't know if we'll talk about that one or not, but it, there's a lot of divergence. You know, the devil really is in the detail here. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so I think going, go, go ahead, going go back to um, Olga's point, when all these member states and you have different hospital systems within these countries that are asking for this information, I think what makes this um, incredibly confusing is they're expecting that all of your UDI um, requirements for the EU have already been met. Right, they're asking this information as though everything's been met and all of your products comply with MDR and IVDR, where in reality, that's not true for most companies, but yet they're implementing something internally. They want that information, they want it today, they want it tomorrow. And it's really difficult to communicate that here, here this is a work in process, here's what we have today. Some of these numbers are going to change, some of this information is going to change. And I don't think that's clear to most of the hospitals who are implementing. Yeah, so, Olga, Olga, what do you think is driving these national requirements that you were describing? Wow, what a, what a question, Jay. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> 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 um, gosh, I wish I knew. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I would imagine, right, at the end of the day, it, you know, it's really, you know, and high ideals, right? That, you know, for patient safety, you know, and it makes sense, you know, for hospital systems to record the UDI of, of you know, of all classes of devices, you know, for, for numerous reasons, you know, but patient safety, I would imagine in the eyes of the regulator is probably, you know, first and foremost, you know, can, um, help with you know looking at real world evidence it can help in device recalls you know there's there's yeah and then you know just with even uh you know supply chain issues or ordering procurement i mean you know udi is incredibly beneficial and there's lots of case studies especially from the us where i think hospital you know big hospital groups like mercy have implemented programs with udi and the benefits have just been astronomical so i think you know, it's coming from a good place, but I'm not sure that the people in the supply chain or, you know, the various economic operators or healthcare institutions know what's coming down the line. That's a fair point. I mean, certainly everything that you described, the benefits certainly were the reason that we started on this journey in the first place. Um, I don't know that we need to go too far down this rabbit hole, but uh, Dennis, I know you and I have had many conversations over the years about uptake in the U.S. and with without the sort of regulatory requirements, Olga, that you were referring to, um, still with the with the, the goal of, of achieving those benefits. So it's interesting that we're seeing, you know, I sort of see this as a push pull kind of thing, right? You have some of the sort of basic, uh, the MDR, IVDR, the US regulation pushing manufacturers. But now we have some of these requirements kind of pulling UDI farther down in the supply chain into, into uh, actual, you know, hospital records. So I don't know, Dennis, uh, what do you think of, of all those activities in Europe? Well, I think at least some of the requirements are coming from the delays in Udemed, right? Where you have hospitals or distributors or importers looking at these requirements. They know the clock is ticking. They want to implement, they want to make sure they're doing their part. Yet as Udemed has been pushed out, they're, they're beginning to act and they want this information now. They're not going to wait till 2024 for Udemed to be finished or perhaps 2026 when it gets populated. And I think that's part of what's caused some of the confusion. If Udemed had stayed on track, maybe we wouldn't be getting some of those direct requirements from various hospitals. Right. But I think in addition to that, there is a desire to harness UDI and use this information for all the reasons that we all talked about and thought about in the US. I think that's taking place mm -hmm. in Europe. I know it's taking place in Asia where they're interested in harnessing this information for supply chain purposes and also tying it to clinical processes. Appreciate that. Uh, Dennis, I wanna come back to something that you mentioned before. 
and, and Olga, I think you touched on it as well, this notion of variation. <clears throat> so we both, we have, I think, a couple of levels of variation. Um, we certainly have variations in the way that manufacturers have approached UDI, maybe even internal variations across different product lines, uh, which creates a certain set of complexity and challenges. And now we have variation coming in implementation uh, from different regulators or, or others who want to see UDI. How do you manage all of this variation? Olga, I'll start with you. Um, yeah, it's very challenging, I think is the nice way to put it. You know, uh, data-wise, I suppose, when there's something new, you know, we add that data element to our internal UDI database, and then we gather all of the needed data, which sounds really simple, right? But it, honestly, it's not. A lot of the data is housed in, you know, separate systems and all the rest. And so a lot of these new requirements are, are kind of forcing us to, you know, now look at, you know, having one source of truth and where we house all of that data. So, but when a country, you know, comes with these new requirements, they don't account for all of this work, right? So sometimes we struggle to meet their very ambitious timelines. You know, luckily, as we said earlier, you know, for the, for the most part, okay? Um, you know, a lot of the countries, you know, a lot of the, the main data, let's say, is, is harmonized with that IMDRF data set. Um, but we're still submitting manually um, via spreadsheet templates um, for a lot of countries, you know, due to varying UDI requirements, you know, like internally we've set, you know, kind of what we have as our global harmonized requirements, if you like, you know, if they meet, you know, these kind of bulk of, you know, what we're seeing as um, global requirements. But when one country does something different, you know, that makes a big difference. Um, and it can be things like, you know, in Saudi, you know, they won't have the non-concatenated or the split barcodes. So that really kind of throws everything. So, you know, while we have a centralized system, all those little variations have a big impact on it. Um, but, you know, if you try, I suppose, and, and, and do it in a way that makes sense, um, and try to have a kind of a global data set so far as possible. And you can, you know, kind of look and analyze which countries, you know, you, okay, this country, you know, it, it fits in that box. Then you can move forward very quickly, you know, and I suppose even when it doesn't, you can make strategic decisions, you know, more quickly. So, but to be, yeah, to be honest, yeah, just very, very, very challenging. <laughs> yes. Dennis, you brought the topic up. Do you want to talk sure. about variation a little bit? Yes, I guess first off, let's let's go over what's different without going into country by country or listing all the specific requirements. The data requirements are different, right? You can't assume that your US data can be used in all these other countries. You might be able to recycle some of your attributes, but not all of them. There are some differences in the UDI marking requirements right, where you have to use either a different type of barcode or you have to use different information, um, right? So your markings are gonna be different in some instances. I think your regulatory construct is different where you think of the difference between a kit or a procedure pack, or if you look at just the different classifications of these products and what is expected. Risk class vary just because a product risk class one, you can do something in the US, you can't assume that's true for risk class one in another market, that's going to be different. Um, the due dates, they're not all lined up. And I think as many countries were building around the EU, as the EU has pushed out their dates, that's thrown things off. If we think of exceptions, because an ex it's an exception in one country does not mean the next country is going to agree with that exception. And I think if we look at the triggers, the triggers vary significantly country by country. So that tells us we can't have one single plan we can't assume because something complies with UDI in one country, it's going to comply in the next. That's caused us to do things very differently. We have to revisit our labels or at least do a gap assessment as each country comes up with their regulation to make sure it still works. We have to have an active program in place to manage our data. We'd like to have recyclable attributes. We can use them globally, 
but that's not what we're seeing. We're seeing that we have some attributes that are good globally. We see that some are good in more than one country, and we see that some are country specific. We need an active effort to manage all that data and keep it up, a um, change control process. And I think that's proving to be incredibly difficult as we look at the UDI DI triggers to make sure that we really understand this and we're making the changes. And that's led us to have really an integrated program where what we're doing is we're aligning between countries, business units, and a central team. But I think getting that alignment is critical and having well thought through and planned um, you know, projects to make sure this all comes together is essential. It's interesting. Well, uh, I want to move on to the next question. We could obviously talk about this for a while, but uh, my sort of last thought on that, Dennis, and, and I'm sure you remember this, when we started this journey, as I said, nearly 20 years ago, actually 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, one of the, the pillars was sort of a globally harmonized approach, right? The idea was that um, that I could use and reuse UDI data in, in any country that wanted to develop a UDI program. That was, that was sort of one of the founding principles um, of this, which is why when we started this, it was not just a U.S. effort, but it was a U.S. effort in conjunction, which at the time the GHDF group and then morphed into IMDRF and working bilaterally at the time with, with many of our regulatory partners, but what seems to have happened as time has gone on is that, you know, this notion of a sort of single global UDI and a single label that I can use anywhere in the globe is becoming a bit of a challenge. And we're starting to maybe actually look again at regional labeling um, or, you know, those notions of, of maybe not having a single label, single approach, single UDI, single data set. Just a thought, um, and again, I don't want to, you know, unwind all the work that we've done, but that's certainly um, so, an interesting observation, I think, uh, over the past 20 years, which I think brings us to the next question, um, though I, I think maybe we've covered much of this, but um, what what is the, I mean, aside from the impacts, Dennis, that you've talked about, any other impacts uh, that these various regulations are bringing to to the way that you identify products or label products or the way that you deal with products that are then distributed? Do you see differences or changes in the way your distribution practices, maybe some more over-labeling or just-in-time labeling, anything like this in terms of uh, implementation? Well, the EU certainly caused a lot of changes, right? When to have a product that's I think right now for European Union, when you look at different intended uses and you look at some of the changes and you look at what's required by Buddy, it is increasingly difficult to have one single global product. And we still have some, we absolutely still have products that are sold globally, but it requires a tremendous amount of planning and you might have to change your catalog number and your UDIDI to get there. And that's something that has to be thought through. I mean, you can do it, but it comes at a cost when you think of going back and maybe it's going to trip some additional registrations as you think of lining up some of those intended uses, right? It very well could. Or if you think about maybe you're adding new production identifiers to that product to make sure it's universally acceptable. And then in some of those jurisdictions, right, that's a new UDI DI trigger. So you can do it, but it requires a whole lot of planning and even something as simple as brand name changes, right? Some of these things that we have as triggers, they seem simple to manage on an individual country by country basis. It seems simple, but when you look at it globally and you start adding up all these various constructs and you look at the different definitions, it's much more complicated. And that's something that we're continuing to review and think through of whether or not a true global label works, or if you have to have um, maybe in a CE marked and a non CE marked version, all those, all those topics are up for discussion now. Or even if you look at supplemental labeling right. and you look at what's occurring in countries like Japan, where you think of a supplemental label and how are you accounting for it? How do you identify which product does or doesn't have the supplemental label and are you using a suffix or prefix to get at it? I don't think there's one simple answer to all of this, but UDI is forcing us to rethink some of those decisions. How about you, Olga? Yeah, I mean, I I don't think you can 
underestimate the difference the you know variation in regulations around the world makes um i'm primarily involved in in the eu at the moment um and i guess i'm kind of <laughs> well i'm trying to be optimistic and you know like the eu are chairing the img <laughs> next year in 2023 so you know, kind of one of the strategic advocacy things I suppose we'd be hoping to do is really drive them, you know, down the road of global harmonization, which is the whole point of the IMGRF, right? Um, so, you know, when they're coming up with concepts like this master UDIDI, which is um, an identifier for highly individualized devices, which is a concept they may be bringing forward, um, at the moment, it's just for contact lenses, but because there's no definition of what a highly uh, individualized device is, the fear in industry at the moment is that, you know, it could go down the path of, you know, sutures, screws, um, you know, all kinds of other devices. Um, we've even heard IVDs mentioned at one point, but, you know, these kind of concepts, this, this is a new concept, you know, brought up or, you know, thought up in the EU basically to tackle an issue with the database because they didn't want to have so many UDIGIs in Udemad, um, but it would be on the label. It, or at least that's what we're hearing now. And just the disruption that that would create to the you know global supply chain and the confusion it would cause on markets outside of the EU, you know, can't be underestimated. So I just, I really am a proponent of global harmonization so far as possible. I mean, I think we'll always have a little bit of divergence and, you know, a little bit, I think we can, we can deal with, right? But when we start to see these major divergences, it's just like, it's, uh, it's, it's, fright it's a little bit frightening, really. <laughs> I think it's a little more than a little frightening. I think it's very frightening. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It's interesting, you know, um, I, not 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 to pick on you or pick on words, but um, you know, in the in the transition that occurred between the GHTF and IMDRF, a number of things happened, but one of one of them was something, and and maybe I'm paraphrasing or maybe I'm remembering a little bit incorrectly, but one thing that Dr. Shuren, head of CRH said was that he wanted to move from harmonization to convergence. So it wasn't that we were sort of thinking about doing things kind of the same way, but really that we were doing things the same way. And, and, and you know, those words might mean different things to different people, but I, for me, that notion of, of convergence, literally doing things exactly the same way um, is something that I think doesn't necessarily happen organically, right? I think so some of what we're seeing, some of the maybe growth pains that we're seeing as countries come to this who haven't. and and you know you get, I know I know we've all spent some time uh, with, for example, uh, the TGA in Australia who've been trying to understand this and how does it work and what are the problems and all this. All right that whole process of sort of learning about things and what's worked and what doesn't and what where should we improve? And are we all making those uh, changes or, or improvements at the same time, right? You, you you sort of see this whole thing kind of being out of step a bit, right? As, as countries come along and think, well, that's good, but we could make it better by doing this or that, right? So I don't know, for me, I, I have maybe some optimism of today, don't ask me tomorrow, it could be different, um, that, you know, as we sort of move along um, that, countries will iterate towards you know the common sort of the common sense of all this that, that we will actually over time converge i know we see all the differences and it drives us a little mad but i i wonder if you think what you think of that if you think as countries come on and as new requirements dennis you mentioned you know, sort of there's an assumption that UDI is done by many people, right, by regulators as well in other countries. Oh, well, that's done. So I can just add to it or improve upon it, not really understanding the implication of that. Um, so are, I don't know, are you optimistic that we might converge at some point here? Maybe not in our working lifetime, but uh, at some point down the road? How do you do a reset, right? When you look at <laughs> 
when you look <laughs> at the fact that the EU has a regulation that's set, they don't want to make any changes to it. I think that US FDA, right, it's set, that's their plan. I think you've seen this, you know, some of the same from other regulators. And I think that when you speak to some of these regulators and you look at it, I think there's acknowledgement that there could be steps taken to harmonize. I think that TGA, I give them high marks for looking for every opportunity they can possibly find to align with the US and Europe, right? They're going out of their way to try to harmonize this and make it as um, aligned as they possibly can. But how do you do a reset when you have different definitions and different requirements? We take something as simple as a primary DI, right? What is our primary UDI DI? It means something very, very specific in the US. It means something different in China, right? China and South Korea will use that same term, but it means something different. How do you go back and make the changes to those systems? I, I don't know. Or even when you take things like kits or implants, that means something different in different countries. You could say this is a kit in this country, it's not a kit in the next country. I don't know how you change the underlying construct and get it set. I certainly hope we see some convergence. I don't think we wanna see um, you know, 50 different regulations with 50 different sets of requirements. I do hope we see some convergence, but I, I don't know how that happens. Olga's got the big magic reset button. <laughs> I wish, oh, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Uh, no, I don't. I, unfortunately, I don't have a magic research button. Uh, reset. I think I'd be very rich if I did. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Get well paid for that. Right. Um, <laughs> but no. Um, I mean, I, I would. I would certainly like to be optimistic. Um, you know, as somebody with kind of advocacy in my title, um, I suppose. I, I think we need to continue to influence this, right, as much as we can in ev every way that we can, you know, through all of the different stakeholder groups and via all of the different trade associations or, you know, issuing entity um, organizations and so on and so forth. Um, and we have seen, you know, when we see new countries come online, like not necessarily the EU or you know some of the bigger players but when we see smaller markets like I know Australia is big but it's still a smaller market in comparison right they have been so open to it from an advocacy perspective and as you said Dennis right they did such a great job with stakeholder engagement and kind of you know this is what we're thinking of doing you know we'd like some feedback but also you know like properly scrutinizing that feedback and you know then you know bringing it into or you know, updating their requirements to acknowledge that. That's great. And you know, there have been some other countries, you know, that have done that as well. They mightn't have given us everything we wanted, but you know, they they have changed their requirements. So I think getting in at the ground level as these things are in draft or even as they're being dreamt up is is really the way we have to go. Right. <laughs> um you, you know moving forward um and for what's already done yeah i mean if if there was a magic research reset button that would be great you know maybe some of the economics or supply chain issues you know when that's brought to bear and right. you, you know highlighted or even you know i think some of our concerns you know without going into the legislation but in in legislation in some of the countries are well you know what you're trying to do is really you know make recalls easier and you know it's you know to benefit patient safety and all of these things yet the requirements that you know you've actually implemented aren't doing that because of various reasons so i think when some of those issues come to light you know hopefully it will be that push you know towards uh, more harmonization or you know convergence would be ideal but right. i don't know if i'm that optimistic <laughs> <laughs> fair enough mike why don't we go to the next question um i think we've touched on some of these um but maybe i'll ask you to to look beyond your four walls um to to, to the industry as a whole Olga, you've touched a little bit on this from an advocacy perspective um, but also the rest of the players. I mean, I know we've talked a lot about kind of the, the manufacturer view, the producer view, um, but uh, what, what other 
challenges so beyond beyond the, the the medical device manufacturer industry but to maybe the larger ecosystem as a whole uh, what do you see some of the challenges are and what can we do to try to resolve them moving forward if we think about healthcare providers i think there are two or three themes that come up continually certainly in the us but even beyond one is udi di triggers right that is a confusing concept for the healthcare provider, or I suppose for distributors that don't understand exactly when a device manufacturer has made a change, right? The regulators set the rules, device manufacturers are adhering to them, but if you're not involved in those decisions, it's really complicated to understand when a device changed and what the impact is. And you think of um, deleting one product and bringing a new one on, and then trying to make it clear what changed about that device. Right. And you can't necessarily call it this, you can't say it's the exact same, right? I mean, I know there's some instances, if it was because of quantity, you could you could yeah. look them in the eye and you could say, yes, it's the same device, but I changed right. my quantity, therefore it's different UDI, DI, but generally something has changed, right? A warning, uh, maybe one of the materials in that product, there's usually something a little bit different, even if the user is going to manage it the same way. I think the concept of UDI, DI and aligning with catalog numbers, I think that's still causing a whole lot of confusion. That there are different practices amongst different device manufacturers for whether it's a many to one or one to many. And I think that has to get sorted out because I think we make it really difficult for you know, the regulator or the healthcare provider to use that. So I think those are some of the external problems. I think there's others, I mean, that we could look at that device manufacturers, I think need clarity. And if we think of configurable devices, I think that remains an area that needs work. I think software and how we identify software becomes critical. And then the one um, you know we've been discussing with kits and procedure packs, I think those are all areas that uh, need further definition and we do need convergence across industry and also with regulators. I agree. Olga, what do you think? Yeah, I I completely agree with everything that, that Dennis has just said. You know, in terms of the, the UDI triggers, I think one of the most challenging aspects um, can be that, you know, there can be a list of triggers in the legislation itself. But, you know, what we're seeing is that some of these databases that are being built up by the Ministries of Health um, have, I suppose, what we call de facto triggers because there are data elements that you can't change. And if you can't change it, it's a trigger. But, you know, we're seeing that they, they won't actually acknowledge that as the case. So, you know, things like that are incredibly challenging. L looking outside, you know, of you know to other stakeholders in the environment um i think education is 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 badly needed i think that a lot of the other stakeholders in the ecosystem have absolutely no idea of what's coming down the line i mean i i see requests from hospitals all the time asking us to give them the udi for our devices and you know there's just not that connection that actually no you, you don't just need the the udi di you need to record the udi of your device you need to pick that device up look at the label you know and preferably scan the barcode right <laughs> right um and you know there's just a disconnect they right. they they don't understand this they don't really know what udi is you know especially you know the the smaller hospitals you know you know okay bigger gpos etc might already be using it um you know for demand planning and, and whatnot but there's that disconnect and then also when you have requirements that are you know you need to record the udi but only for class three implantable devices well how does somebody <laughs> receiving devices into the hospital have any idea <laughs> if a device is a class three implantable or not like that's insane they're not a, you know a regulatory affairs professional and even if you were if you were looking at competitors devices if something was very obvious you could guess but i mean not in all cases right, right. so you know things like that like how, how do they identify it and to, you know to your point dennis earlier you know with udamed not being ready that probably doesn't help but 
in all fairness, I think even when it is ready, I, I wouldn't be sure that that would help. You know, what, what are we expecting them to do then? Mass download, you know, UDI for all manufacturers across, you know, all the device categories that they use to identify what's the glass implantable. Um, you know, I think manufacturers are probably going to have to provide some of this information to them. Um, but, you know, to another point you said earlier, Dennis, if, you know, if your devices haven't transitioned, you mightn't have all of that information yet in your internal databases, because these were not data attributes that we had to, you know, capture under the directives in Europe, for example. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's, you know, well, there's, uh, you know, scope. For, for this to be brilliant. Like, I think UDI is a fantastic concept and, you know, absolutely we need to press forward with it. I, we can't underestimate the challenges to everybody uh, in the ecosystem. And I think honestly, you know, as challenging as it may be for manufacturers, I think that other stakeholders are even more in the dark. Right, that's a good point. You know, it's interesting. I've, I've said this in the past and I, I think it's still largely true particularly from a device manufacturer perspective, that the challenges with UDI implementation have nothing to do with UDI per se, right? It's not about assigning DIs or, you know, putting barcodes on products. Some of the things we thought, I don't know, Dennis and I have, have a long history where we would talk about the challenges of barcoding products and, you know, well, that's going to be hard and expensive. And that turned out to be kind of the trivial part. Um, so it, it wasn't so much, you know, the, the barcoding of products, it, it's really the internal systems, the identification that you both have talked about, and, and how I manage my internal identification versus my external identification of products getting into catalog numbers and DIs and all this and, and the data that goes with it. So, and I found that, again, the challenges with UDI are, are to the, the broader ecosystem of the organization and not necessarily with sort of the mechanics of UDI in and of itself. So I think that's just been an interesting observation over the past decade, and I think that will continue. Yeah. Um, so Mike, with that, let's go to, I think our last question. Um, and then we have a couple of questions from the audience and, and we've got about 15 minutes or so left. So um, we can take a few, few moments here and then we can dive into the questions that came from the audience. Um, Dennis, I know you and I have talked a lot about uh, all the technological challenges that are coming up, the whole, and Olga, you touched on it, you know, the concatenated versus not, linear barcodes, 2D barcodes, maybe some RFID coming along. We could talk about direct marking probably for a day and a half. Um, what, uh, what, what do you see from a technological perspective, Dennis? Well, I think one, and you've made mentioned a second ago is 2D barcodes. I think there's a lot of interest in migrating towards a 2D barcode, right? I mean, it's easier to get it to fit on most labels, right? No question. But I don't think this can happen in a big bang theory unless it's coordinated across the entire industry. When you look at general distribution, it's still the linear barcode that's going to drive general distribution until some deliberate effort is made to switch to 2D. And I don't know who owns this or how it gets, um, fully aligned and coordinated, but I know that I've seen instances where we change from a um, GS1128 barcode to a data matrix, and guess what happens? We get complaints in, in certain parts of the world because a hospital can't scan a 2D barcode, right? So it comes in a com as a complaint. And I know that GS1 has, um, I think, an interesting project underway to try to migrate to 2D, particularly for retail. And it's something where healthcare is looking at this, but I think there has to be an effort to move to 2D and think of what that migration path is. Seems like 1D and 2D need to coexist for some time. And what does that label look like? Can we get agreement across the industry? I, when I go through distribution center, I see a lot of variations of that, but it seems like we need some plan to think of what that barcode of the future looks like. It's probably a 2D barcode but how do we get there? I think that's a huge technological consideration. I think RFID is another one that we have to think about. Yes, um, you can use RFID for UDI in some instances in some countries, right. but I don't think you're gonna do that instead of using a barcode, right? You're gonna have to have both, at least for, um, for the immediate future, you're gonna have to. But what if you wanna have RFID to make it easier to track a product but you're not going to be UDI compliant. 
right? Because there's instances where you can't, you can't say that you're putting all your UDI requirements in that RFID tag. So I think the AIDC component is enormous. I think that's an area that we're gonna have to watch. And then I think the other one is um, with databases. How are we going to have databases, whether you've got a PIM system or whatever you're doing, set to where you can really manage and maintain all this data? I agree. Olga, any, any technological challenges from your end or you have this all figured out along with your reset button? Definitely, all figured out. No problems at all. Uh, no, I just, I was kind of giggling internally because I, I got a question earlier on today and this is verbatim. A customer is asking if we can indicate that all devices traditionally uh, transitioning to MDR will be utilizing QR codes. <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> or the linear barcode and that was directly from the customer like this was some this is somebody in the region who you know wouldn't be very involved in UDI so but like like these are the type of questions we're getting right. um so yeah I think I think it's challenging um and then you know so I I explained you know a lot of what Dennis was saying well not 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 nothing exactly the same but just that it, you know we you could have there were a lot of ways of complying that you could have a linear barcode or a 2d matrix or rfid um and then so you, you know the question was well then can we say that all of our devices have 2d and i was like no <laughs> no no we can't like most of them do but like i can't can't make that assumption either you know so yeah i mean there's there's a lot of technological challenges and I think yeah in an ideal world we would all you know migrate towards one thing um I think from a from a manufacturer's perspective you know what what we find challenging just from purity you know what we have to do um you know with the data and stuff is that you know and we touched on it earlier it's you know generating and sending UDI data from one data system to different countries with different rules different data requirements and then different gateways or modes of transmission as well like how are you even sending it and who's sending it is it the manufacturer is it your authorized rep it, you know you, you know all that kind of stuff depending on the country um and if it's not you, you know, what are they equipped to do, right? Uh, and, and are they even asking you sometimes? You know, you have to reach out and kind of say, well, you know, can we please give you this data? Don't, don't, it by yourself. don't, don't make it you up know? on your own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and then, you know, even when you can send to the system, however, whichever way you've done it, depending on the requirements, you know, getting different system responses back in different formats, saying different things. So, like, there's just, so much going on right. in so many countries around the world that yeah it's challenging it's challenging for everybody um and then of course you know the hospitals if they have the correct infrastructure um you know and and if they if, if they have any infrastructure at all can it read 2d can it read rfid you know so these are all challenges um that are going to have to be i think figured out and i you know, there's going to have to be investment um, from other stakeholders, I think, in the supply chain, um, including hospitals, into um, technology to help them with this. But I, I, I hope that somebody, and it's not necessarily our jobs, but I know that trade associations and learning communities have been trying their best, you know, to educate right. other stakeholders. But, right. you know, all the case studies out there show that when you do invest, it, it actually it pays for itself and, and then some, you know, the benefits are, you know, really really good yeah the other the other area that i see and, and i know we've talked a little bit about this amongst ourselves is kind of the, the retail portion of this you know we 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 have a fair number of medical devices which move not necessarily into hospitals right now that there, there may be other terms or concepts that are used in, you know in the u.s we certainly have you know, lots of devices available at, at what I call a retail pharmacy, right? I can go buy things, you know, and but I can also buy a lot of stuff online and have that distributed. And then we don't really have good concepts for what that is. And so as we look at some of these other um, maybe non-primary distribution channels that we have, you know, how do we identify the product there? And is, is can we can use the same or do we need to be different because they have different needs? And so 
Um, I think there's also that whole piece of it, which is a little bit unique to the device space, as opposed to say the pharma space, where there's a very clean line between what is a prescription product, if you will, and what you might buy yourself. So I think there's a whole area in, in, in that sort of retail, using the term loosely, that um, creates a lot of challenges for, for certain manufacturers of certain product types. So just another area that we continue to struggle with. Um, in the last couple of minutes, we have some questions. Um, I will I will paraphrase them, and I won't uh, attribute them um, for good or bad. Um, but there was a question around um, loaner kits, uh, sets of implants and related tools, and how they should be identified, um, and and what what we should do about those. Uh, any thoughts there? Do you have loaner kit stuff? We do not. So I'm going to defer to you, Olga. <laughs> <laughs> either, either do we. Um, oh, what's okay. technologically feasible? Jay, I think you're actually best place to answer this one. Well, so when we think, uh, if we think about sets of implants or you know, implants more generally, I'll put, I'll put maybe loaner kit aside and talk about implants and our, our sort of need to identify individual implants, maybe regardless of how they are coming into the organization. We certainly have sterile implants and I think we all understand that, how that works. I think when we get into sort of this non-sterile implant space, and whether that's implants and instruments or not, it's, it, it's the same idea. If we have these, these, these things that get reused or sorry, they don't get reused, they get reprocessed, sterilized again, and then potentially used in, in a new environment. I think we've yet to really understand how we're going to deal with the whole non-sterile implant space, you know, regardless of, of, of sort of whether it's a whether it's a loaner kit or whether it's come it's something the manufacturer the, the hospital has themselves or the manufacturers bringing it in. I think the whole notion of non-sterile implants and the need to find a way of identifying that implant at the point of implantation is absolutely key. Um, but is an enormous challenge. Many of these things, as we all know, are very small and putting barcodes on them is very difficult, but we really haven't, I don't know, I, I don't feel like we've, we've really um, progressed the conversation very much. There was a lot of angst and, and hand-wringing in the U.S. when the U.S. rule came out. We, we have some angst and hand-wringing going on in, in Europe but I don't know that we've actually progressed the conversation at all. Uh, I don't know if you guys think we have or have other thoughts on it. No, I, I, I think it all comes down to what's technologically feasible, right? And I'm not sure that we've gotten to that point yet. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of unanswered questions. Right. Um, yeah, be interesting to see how it plays out in the EU. I know that you've basically got an exemption for it in the US, right? But we're not quite there with the EU. We're still wondering mm. what's going to happen. I wouldn't say it was an exemption in the US. It was a it was a okay manufacturers go figure this out and come back with a solution and nothing has really happened. So I mean yeah. we haven't really I mean it wasn't intended to 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 you know defer the, the solution indefinitely, it was intended to provide an opportunity for solutions to be developed and implemented, but we haven't done that. So, and I, I feel like every other country coming along is going to have, I mean, this is a big part, as Olga, as you said earlier, I mean, a big part of why UDI is there is to document and, under, you know, to understand real world data, real world evidence, you know, what patients have what. So, I mean, I feel like we need to, we, not three of us on the call, but the broader we need to really, you know, engage in that conversation. And to your point, Olga, you know, find some, you know, help facilitate some technological solutions that will help move the ball down the road, or down the field. Um, I don't know, Dennis, do you have uh, any? Well, it, it's not a product category that we manufacture, but I have been kind of following along and studying the problem and noted that healthcare providers have expressed some dissatisfaction with the current solutions that are out there, right? So you have a dissatisfied user. And I agree, I think it's something that industry should come up with some solutions that meet the healthcare providers needs, or we may see some regulator coming up with something on their own that we don't like. 
and that's right that's a real possibility so i think it is one of those areas that needs to be revisited and some better solutions need to be devised yeah i'd, I'd absolutely agree with you i think that's the biggest risk though so if if we don't come back with solutions for this one will be given to us that we we probably won't like you know related to that and um uh, it, it, the, the question, I, or it's my understanding of the, the second part of that question, um, relates to what I call parent-child relationships, right? So, you know, what is in a, in a procedure pack or an IVD kit, or maybe we can even talk about some of the, the non-sterile implant kits um, or, or trays or sets, you know, there's an interest, I think, on the part of some, whether it's regulators or users, to know specifically what's in that that kit, and I know there's a number of procedure pack, um, there's a number of exceptions that allows those products to not be UDI compliant. Um, but do you think that's a, the best path forward or do you see us really identifying everything that's within something else so that we have that visibility, creating those parent-child relationships in the databases so I know exactly what's going into each kit or pack? Um, that's certainly an issue that we talked about early on in development of UDI and kind of kicked the can down the road because it is clearly a big topic, but um, it's coming back up again. And I, I certainly, um, Dennis, to your point, I certainly could, could foresee a regulator coming along and deciding that they want that visibility. Um, it, what do you think? Yeah, it would seem like at a minimum, there should be some means of explaining a parent-child relationship in a database, right? At a minimum, you should be able to state this IVD kit contains and be able to describe another product inside of it that bears its own UDI-DI, right? There should be some means of doing that. Right. I don't know that it's going to be practical to put it on the label in each and every instance, but there should at least be something where we could electronically draw that association. Right. Olga, are you ready to develop uh, all your parent-child relationships with all your packs and kits and things? Uh, absolutely. We were, we were <laughs> born, Jay. <Eddie> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, again, I think it's it's one of those, I, I agree with what you said, Dennis, by the way, but I, I think kind of the whispers are, you know, kind of what we're hearing in the corridors of what some regulators might be asking for. I, I'm not sure that that is feasible you know, that kind of level. And, and I'm not sure that it's, you know, of, of the added value that it brings, right, versus the burden. Um, I do think, of course, you should be able to identify devices within a procedure pack, but down to the UDI, uh, I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, think, I think there's a middle ground <laughs> somewhere in between that hopefully, you know, we can all land on where, where everybody's happy. But to your point, it probably needs some advocacy, right? We need to be having those conversations and, and not passively wait to see what happens. Exactly. Um, the, final, the final question, I think, Olga, I'll, 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 I'll sort of pass to you, which is really coming back to this, this advocacy notion. Um, you know, any other thoughts about how we educate all of these other stakeholders, other countries, other regulators, you know, other, again, other, other participants, any other ideas about or thoughts on how we really try to have that, that conversation and, and make it, make it relevant to, to all stakeholders and, and really improve um, the sort of the ecosystem that we're trying to develop here. Well, that's the, that's a big question. Uh, so one important. minute. <laughs> I think I think the most important thing is having the lines of communication open. And I know that sounds very basic, but honestly, you know, you'd be surprised. And I think you know, providing that that feedback, and not just like I'll use the EU as an example. Okay, so not just at the EU at the MedTech Europe level, but you know, reaching out via your, your national trade associations to your national, you know, to your competent authorities. Because I think there's this perception that everybody who's working uh, in the UDI space or even kind of, you know, legislating and coming up with new requirements is highly educated in UDI and, you know, knows 
knows in depth everything about all, all the conversation, you know, all, all the concepts. But I think what you might find in reality is something very different or people, you know, that have a theoretical idea idea and i'd be one of those people right i mean i can advocate i have a theoretical idea i'm not in the like in deep in the implementation like you know dennis or yourself jay um so you know i, I think it's really important to bring the views of of people who are educated um you know to to the national competent authorities for example and you know we found anyway you know in cases where we have done it you know and if you if you can do it in in a in a good way that is not aggressive or you're doing everything wrong or you know but really you know just trying to collaborate and you know raise some concerns or you know just voice your your opinion but you know in an appropriate way they can be very open to listening you know right. and you know because at, at the end of the day you know nobody wants barriers to trade right. you know the, the idea is patient safety um right. but if the requirements um aren't doing that and only creating barriers to trade then you know i think regulators should be open open to listening you at least hope so so i mean like that that's a huge question you could talk about it all day so Good. i hope that answered a tiny bit communication 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 all right thank you oh well, i appreciate it thank you all that olga thank you very much dennis thank you very much aim thank you very much for for hosting us and, and thank you everyone who participated uh, we looked, uh, we enjoyed it, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Um, if you have any um, questions for us, here is our contact information. Uh, we all spend a lot of time in this topic, so we're, we're happy to continue the conversation as well. And, and with that, I thank you all very much for your time and uh, wish you all a great rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Jay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye -bye.